Quilt Central is made possible in part by Bernina of America. Nothing sews like a Bernina. Nothing. Quilting Machines International, providing quilting machines and supplies for the world. Sulky of America, taking creativity to new heights with decorated threads, stabilizers, and books. American Professional Quilting Systems, hand-guided elegance. The American Quilter Society, dedicated to promoting today's quilter. Paducah, McCracken County Convention and Visitors Bureau. Paducah, where no one is a stranger. Additional funding was provided by these companies that care about quilting. Welcome to Quilt Central. Celebrating quilting in everyday living with your host, Jane Donaldson and Donna Wilder. We're going to be decorating another room today that we call our tween room. Let's take a look at the before. And now, let's take a look at the tween room. We didn't have to do too much. We consulted our local tweens to come up with some great ideas for this room. They decided it would be fun to have a really bright quilt on the bed, so we created that for it. And then they wanted to strip together the bold colors from the color connectors as the background for their little jean patchwork section where they added some great color into each one of those back pockets. And one of our tweens was a ballet dancer, so we asked our guest today to create a little ballet wall hanging. So now let's take a look and meet our guest, Joining me is Joyce Drexler. Welcome, Joyce. Well, it's always a pleasure, Donna, and I'm very excited about today's show because this is something that grandmothers and mothers can do with their daughters or their sons. Uh, of course, for the ballet slippers that we're going to show today, it's best with the girls, I guess. I think so. <laughs> How did This is a new technique. I haven't seen it done before. Well, Carol Ingram, one of our designers, actually came up with this idea, and it's really fascinating and so quick and easy. You're actually making a faux applique look. Uh-huh. Well, let's see how you do it. Okay. First, of course, we start off with a design that mm -hmm. we like. And once we have the design uh, drawn out, then we want to use temple, uh, template plastic mm -hmm. and just get ourselves a, a cut of the basic design. I don't Good. trace the ribbon at this time, just these. Then, you're actually going to use all-purpose heavy, heaviest, coarsest sandpaper that you can find. Okay. And I know that seems a little strange to be using We usually sandpaper. use very fine paper, so. <laughs> <laughs> but for this technique, uh, what you want to do is just put your uh, design on there and trace around it and cut out the shape. Good. And then we start uh, actually designing the shoe coloring. And this is done with, with crayons. You do this all with, with regular, crayons. regular crayons, and of course, whatever colorize your coloring type of design you're doing, right. you would choose that. Of course, I'd like a big box of crayons. That was my favorite Christmas <laughs> present. I'd get these big boxes. That's it. So I love doing so crayons. So you just take your crayons, and I've just done this in, in different uh -huh. shades, and you can actually shade on the um, on the. Uh, sandpaper if you want right. to, or you can do some of your shading later. Now, this is what it's going to look like when you iron it in place. Uh -huh. um, let me see if I've got the right shoe here. As you notice, it always reverses your right. image. And that's why on the templates, I always put uh, uh, the right side oh, letters right. so I know which way I'm, I'm going when I have the... It gets very confusing it, it, When you have while. to flip something over, I it know. always does. But see, this is actually that flipped okay. over. And so what you want to do is, I'm just going to place it here and show you, um, of course, it'd be blank if right. we did it. I would put a very firm cardboard underneath. Mm -hmm. And then to um, protect your iron, you're going to want to put a, a Teflon pressing sheet over it. Okay. Because sometimes little bits of the crayon dribble, and you right. don't want to get that on the bottom of your iron. And then you simply press uh, very hard uh -huh. and sort of move it around without moving your, your template, ho hopefully. Uh -huh. And that is actually melting the wax into the fabric. Is it permanent once it melts the wax? Yes. It's, uh, it, it actually just melts right into the fabric. Now, if you want a very bright look, you should use a poly blend. Uh, okay. You'll get a softer look with cotton. Okay. Because after you've done this process, you will then put this in the washer and wash it 
to get any excess off. Okay. Then you go back to the other treatment. Now, yeah. right now we have um, these shoes, but we don't mm -hmm. have any ribbon or anything right. on them. So the next step would be to um, take your design, and I've already got okay. it on this one ready for us. Let's move this over. Take your design and place it underneath. And mm -hmm. I like to use the uh, temporary spray adhesive okay. to keep the design in place because that's important. You're going to be using a crayon and it could be shifting around as you're tracing. Right. Now, what I did was I could see through that to trace the ribbon design, mm -hmm. and all I did was trace it with a ribbon, uh, I mean, with the crayon. Right. And then I just color it in with Ooh. whatever shade I want to use. And you can see how these crayons get really short after a while. Yes. <laughs> so save all those broken crayons that you've got from your kids and uh, use those. Now, if I wanted a more coarse look as I was shading in, I could take the, um, the sandpaper and actually put that underneath. Um, oh, and you know, is. Once I have that all drawn, yeah. I can do that. I can take that off. And I can just place this over the sandpaper, and you can see that was a very yes. smooth look. Now, when you color with this, you see it's bumpy. Oh, it, yes. So if you want a bumpier, raised kind of look uh -huh. like that, put the sandpaper back under there as you're embellishing. And also, use your crayons to help you uh, get different shading areas in there. You'll, you'll end up using several colors of, of crayons, not just one color, uh -huh. uh, for areas, because that's what makes it look so interesting when it's finally transferred, as it does on the, on the finished piece. And then you stitched around uh, all of it. Then I layered it over a, a relatively thick batting, mm -hmm. and I stitched over it with a twist uh, rayon thread because it has two threads that are twisted together to create the color and you get this really muted soft look and that's what I wanted behind those slippers and I just quilted on the main lines with um, free motion or you could put the foot on and follow the lines especially right. when you're doing the ribbon it might yeah. be easier that for you. Lovely. Now I see a butterfly over there. Yes the butterfly as you can see is cut out it's always cut out to the shape that you want right. the actual thing to be and what a I wanted to point out too is that you want to make sure you get a lot of crayon along the edges okay. because that is what really shapes your design okay. and wherever there isn't any crayon it's going to leave a white space. Well let's take a look at that quilt. Tell sure. me just a little about that. Carol did this one for one of her daughters and um, she thought that it would just fit so nicely in her room being yellow and green and uh, she also then did some direct crayon work directly on the fabric uh -huh. like I just showed you with the um, sandpaper underneath or if you want the smooth like she did the stems you just draw with the crayon right on the fabric and um, the other one was also done using letters now we need to talk about letters and reversed kind of situations that you might have okay well this is a t-shirt and I know that you can transfer this over to wearable concepts as well yes and when so you when you up. do work with a t-shirt I do want to point out it's best if you put some cardboard inside it okay because it will just go right through the, the fabric you to the other side back. <laughs> and again choose a well my label's gone but choose a <laughs> poly blend if you want it to stay okay. bright Good. remember it's gonna fade if you don't now let me just tell you how you get a reverse thing to happen especially when you're thinking about our flag right. Right. Well, here's the finished image. That is where the stars usually are on our flag, uh -huh. and of course the stripes, and I just right. didn't color in where the white stripes were. Mm -hmm. To get this correctly, you need to think in reverse as you're, as you're drawing it on the right. sandpaper. And what I did to get the stars in place, I got some stickers. Oh, good idea. And I simply stuck them on the sandpaper and used that as a... Um, uh, way to block out as I was coloring and that gives you your stars it's just an easy technique but the lettering now mm -hmm. I had to write this backwards. backwards I had to think backwards about it so you also have to think backwards about your S so when you're using your stencil the normal way you know here's your letters yes going the right way but when you get to the S you need to make sure you turn it over when you do the S. Right, so that it does Yeah, the A and the U, you know, you can They're get away fine. with it. They're fine. And uh, that really helps you with doing letters. Now, she also, on that other quilt that we saw earlier that had the, the letters on it, this is like a stencil that you could Great. use. So you can always spray the back of your stencil, Great. put it down, and color away. I love your vest. That is so oh, exciting. Thank you. That's done with the uh, hollow shimmer. Uh -huh. And this hollow shimmer is just a very shiny type of thread. It's just uh, has a reflective 
mylar on top. And it looks so pretty with that color flash. Oh, this color flash with all these blends. I know, I love it. So that's great. Well, I want to thank you for bringing this new technique for us today. Oh, well, you're welcome. The Museum of the American Quilter Society is a major contributor to keeping the quilting tradition alive in America. Of all the programs sponsored by the museum, there is one that invests most heavily in the future of quilt making. Well, the School Block Challenge is an annual event at the Museum of the American Quilter Society, and we pull from a 300-mile radius uh, from Paducah in schools that participate uh, from elementary all the way up to high school. The purpose of the contest is to introduce the next generation to the art of quilt making. Kids work together to create the 16-inch square block. And This summer, we received the fabrics, and the colors were red and blue and black. And at the time, we didn't think anything of it, but when the event happened on September 11th, you know, the tragedy here in the United States, the people that had the fabric, the schools, started. they, they saw a patriotic theme when they saw those colors. Hi, I'm Vanessa Kaiser here at the Museum of the American Quilter Society to introduce you to a few of this year's winners. How did you come up with this idea? Um, well, we were starting to think of um, September 11th and of all the people who are fighting for our country and things. And Mom thought of that name and we all, we all liked it, so that's how we got it. I have a combined group and they were really wanting to try to win grand prize this year, but it's always, we say it's not a matter of winning, but how much we enjoy doing the quilt together and what the, the story means to us. And of course, this quilt is dedicated to the children of the victims in the, in the uh, destruction of the towers. And so we want it to, to be very special. The student quilt blocks are very special. They get to be displayed in the Museum of the American Quilter Society. Cash prizes are awarded to the winning classes to be used for a current need or a future project. Well, I was certainly amazed at what some of the students had done this year, and I can't wait to see what they do next year. Well, I'm Vanessa Kaiser here at the Museum of the American Quilter Society, and we'll see you later. One of the things that quilters like to do is save all their scraps. And I'm the same way. I have five kids. Always have jeans that they have outgrown or they have worn out. And so I cut them up for patches and I save them until I have enough to make a quilt piece. And then I kind of mix and match them so that I have some sort of rhyme or reason to the layout. And with this quilt I had some white jeans and that worked out to give me a diagonal line across there so that's how this one is laid out but you can see by this quilt that there are many different shadings to the denims and you can even reverse a denim and use the other side if you end up with a dark one and you need a light one. I'd like to tell you a couple of tricks about sewing on denim. Um, you have to think about how you're going to finish this quilt piece so you want to keep the thin seams in there and if you're sewing with a serger you put the two pieces together and then you run thread down it you've got all that extra bulk in there and that makes it hard to finish it unless you're tying it off so the best thing to do is to sew it with a straight stitcher and keep the seams flat if you can or trim them down so there's really not much bulk and especially at the corners where they come together you want to pinwheel the layout of the seams in the back so that they don't all bunch up and you get a huge knot in there. Another trick is the needle size. I know you think that when you are sewing on something tough like denim, you should have a real sturdy needle in your machine, but the truth is that you need a skinnier one to pass by those fibers so that it'll go down in with ease and not build a lot of heat or rub the thread so that it gets all frayed out. Now when you quilt on denim, one of the tricks is we try to avoid the seams. And if you can do what we call designing with lines, the lines in the quilt are the seams and the corners. So if you can use the seams and the corners as reference points and use your quilting machine to go from corner to corner and swing some sort of an arc or a loop and go back to near the corner but not 
is through it exactly, you'll be able to do what we call traveling. You can put a design on, maybe another design, and connect them and work your way along the quilt. I always like to start as far out in the edge as I can so that my starting place ends up under the binding and travel across the quilt and figure out a way to go from design to design and end up with my thread under the binding on the other side and then I don't have any threads that could ever pull back or show a knot or any of that sort of thing. So I'll try to sew a little bit of a row in here so you get an idea of how to use your reference points. I'll try to start close to the edge and meander. So you can include your binding or your selvage or your sashing and go from corner to corner, from corner to corner. And work your way right up the block. This one, you can use the reference point there or you can go all the way down on a big block. Now if you wanted to put a design in there, you can just freehand a little design. There's a little daisy, and I'll echo that one time. And go out near the corner and start that same art design again. I hope that will give you some tips on quilting on denim and save all those scraps because they become a valuable piece once you sew them into a quilt top. We're lucky today to have a real tween joining me on the show. Our guest was on the segment that was shown a little bit earlier. She was the reporter for the Museum of the American Quilter Society Quilt Block Challenge for the Students. Joining me is Vanessa Kaiser. Hello. Hi, Vanessa. How are you doing today? I'm great. Well, how, how, how did you get so many great fabrics? I mean, they're awesome. Aren't these fun? Now, do you know what they call that t-shirt you're wearing? Tie-dye. Tie-dye. Well, don't you think these look like tie-dyes? Definitely. This was done by a technique. We took a, um, a piece that was actually dyed. So this mm -hmm. one is the genuine dyed. Then we sent it off to a printer and said, we want you to make a print, not by tie dyeing, in just regular printing technique. Mm -hmm. And this is what they came up with. And isn't that pretty close when you see the way the two look? Are you sure this isn't, this isn't the original? No, this is the copy, this is the original. And the nice thing is, if you're doing quilting, you get a wide range of variety, but you know that every 24 inches, you're gonna have exactly the same pattern. Mm -hmm. So if you want a continuation in your piece, you can have it. Do you quilt? A, a little. A little. Well, I would think with Helen Squire's, uh, Squire as her mom, you would get a lot of quilting in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll have to do a little more later on. Okay. We're talking also about these particular fabrics, and this is what we're going to work in today for the most part. These two look like a dyed fabric, and I'm going to open this up so you can see the pattern on it. It's amazing how from one side of the fabric to the other, it's totally different. It is. And you know what's nice? It looks like if you wanted to cut a piece out of here, it looks kind of variegated. Here you get a much lighter tone. Mm -hmm. Over here you could get a darker tone. So you can get a lot of different variations in it. And it sort of looks like your <laughs> shirt, doesn't it? It's fun. The way these were done is that when you do dyeing, you start with two colors. Here you'd have your green and your blue. And when you dye, you use different percentages of the green and the blue together to create the intermediate colors. So each one of these ranges has those different colors used in it, mm -hmm. and then the ranges in between. Now, this is the quilt we're going to work on. That's kind of neat, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Do you know what, what does it look like to you? What each block? A double star? Yes, that's exactly right. We call it a star within a star. Oh. Now, this is taking a nine patch block. Can you see the nine blocks within the star square? Um, Why don't you point those out? One, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Right, good, that's exactly right. And that's what we're gonna work on today. We do it in units. Now, we're going to start with the first one, and we've taken some triangles and sewn them together. And this was cut from the same piece of fabric, and notice how different it looks. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of these. Once you sew them together, you get this particular unit, and then you put four of those together, and that creates your one patchwork block, which looks like this. And you begin to see the little sections of the star mm -hmm. there. So that's our first one. Now the second one is in a similar manner. You have two triangles sewn together here and two larger ones sewn at that point. And then this is a little bit different and requires a template. Basically, it's a mirror image of that, but it's split with the triangle placed inside there. Then you sew it together and it creates this unit and you're starting to see you know sometimes when you look at it it's hard to tell there's a beginning of a part of that star in there but when you get it together it looks just right and then you take and you make the opposite one because you're going to use that in another section the only other thing that you need are the points that you'll sew together to make the I've got to even look at that and see where those go well you put these two together and then you have your solid blocks which will go around in the corner so what happens next is we're going to try to put these all together so we start with our four corners up here and this is where it's sort of like a puzzle so you're gonna have to help me here and guide this then in the center we know that that's the large square and where this one goes I believe right here in the center area is that correct looks like it yeah that one but I have it backwards there that's that's like it looks there. I've got to do it so that it looks like me. Then these are going down here. And then do they go like this over here? This one turns like that, I believe. So that, this oh, one. Thank you. Thank you. You've got to have that good eye. <laughs> and then this one goes right in here. Is that? Nope. That nope, can't be right. up here. Up, up here? Like you show me. That. Oh, good. I'm so glad you can see this. And then this one has to go here. Of course. And that's how that goes together. Isn't that great? Now, I'm going to take these pieces and turn those around so that you can see. We then sewed those units together, and hopefully this will... Do I have that right? Is that mm -hmm. looking right for them to see it? And you get that outer star with the inner star. I see now. I Isn't that cool? It looks just like that, and you did it in a few seconds. Well, I'm so speedy, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> now I want to see you next time doing this star for us. I'll work on it. Okay. Thanks, okay. Vanessa, for joining me. Thanks for having me. Good. You ever see that annoying little loose stitch that occurs somewhere in your sewing? You're not quite sure where it came from. It doesn't seem that you're going any one direction. You're not quite sure how to get that out of there. Well, a lot of times it can be your take-up spring. And we'll show you a little adjustment that might help you out. This is a tension assembly right here. And this is how they come apart and the order that they're in. This is the tension knob and the tension washer, the tension spring, and the spring washer. This is your tension discs, or you might have a wheel in that place. And this is the tension assembly post. And this is the take-up spring that we're talking about today and the assembly cylinder. One of the things that we can do is if the spring is wearing out, you can interchange that. But when you take your assembly apart, you need to keep it in order so you don't lose track of how that went. And you need to have the pieces facing up so that you know which piece went towards the front. But there's another adjustment that can be done on the machine itself before you have to change the wire. The tension post has a slot in it and a screwdriver will fit right in there and you may want to get just a little more snap on it. So turn it a quarter of an inch tighter and that'll put a little more snap on that wire to pop that loose stitch up every time it sews. So there's a little tip that might help you with that at random loose stitch. Thank you for watching this episode of Quilt Central, number 204, Tween Teen Theme. Be sure to join us next time for Happy Holidays, quilting for a Merry Christmas. Quilt Around the Clock.
visit the Quilt Central website at www.quiltcentraltv.com for more information on this program. Central is made possible in part by Bernina of America. Nothing sews like a Bernina. Nothing. Quilting Machines International, providing quilting machines and supplies for the world. Sulky of America, taking creativity to new heights with decorated threads, stabilizers, and books. American Professional Quilting Systems, hand-guided elegance. The American Quilter Society, dedicated to promoting today's quilter. Paducah, McCracken County Convention and Visitors Bureau. Paducah, where no one is a stranger. Additional funding was provided by these companies that care about quilting. Celebrate quilting in your everyday living. To purchase videotapes of this or any episode of Quilt Central, you may call 1-866-PADUCA.